This is a crazy year, hasn't it? I mean, like, like seriously, who wants to veto this year? Uh, or just skip right past it or maybe have a reset or something? Man, it's crazy stuff happening. You guys, we're, gonna, we're talking about our church values and our family values. So does everybody have one of these? If you don't and you want one, please raise your hand so we can get you one. Okay, we've got a couple people in here. Can I get some people in here? Maybe some, or am I, I'm going to get off the stage and do it. Um, raise them high so we can see. Okay, we've got a couple people over here. I don't mean, I don't mind. I'll get down. I'll do this. It's bananas. It's crazy. Yeah, thank you. Here you go. Can you pass those out for me? Okay, cool. I know, that's not normal, right? Hey, guys online, I'm still here. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that your presence is here that you are made alive in us and you have made us alive. Father, I pray right now that you would silence all the stuff so that we could just focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're talking about our family values. And the ironic thing about this sermon series is we actually, this was set in place and the concepts were made and created probably about seven, eight months ago before this year happened. And, uh, so we do our sermon series usually seven, eight months in advance. We have an idea of what we're talking about. And the crazy thing is God has aligned it all up. You know, I think it's important that we are talking about our family values, our church family values right now, because in order to survive the storms that are going on in the world today, we need to know what we believe and what we value. And that's what's going to root you is knowing what you believe and what you value. Because the Bible talks about it, if we don't know what we under, don't know how to embrace God and what we understand about him, then we're going to be tossed to and fro by different messages and different ideas and different philosophies. And you can see that in the world today, can't you? You can see churches going this way, going that way. You can see beliefs just morphing and going crazy. All kinds of stuff happening. And uh, guys, today, let's just be reminded of what we believe. And you know what? If you want to know what Rockfish believes on a really real level before you actually say, hey, you know what? This is the ship I want to be on. This message is going to be great if you've never been here before. But also we have a, play, a thing called, a class called Starting Point. It meets immediately after this service Right across, the hall, right across the foyer. You can find out everything you need to know about us. It's four classes. It's a great way to know really quickly whether or not we're where you want to be and where you feel like God's called you to be. Okay, guys? So let's dive in. What we've been talking about and is all these values, and we have 15 values that we're really focusing on and honing in on. And, and we started out with talking about love. And love is, is very fundamental to the Christian faith. And I'm not talking about a love that is kind of wishy-washy and, you know, um, Nicholas Sparks-ish. You know, <laughs> I'm not talking about the notebook here, guys. I'm talking about a love that would die and sacrifice and give itself away. I'm talking about a real love. And if you want to know the description of that love, it is found in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is so important. I want to highlight this a little bit today. I'm not going to stay too long on all of them, but this one I want to really highlight because love is not just a character trait of God. It is the essence of God. The Bible says, and you look at the values in the Bible, you look at all the things that are listed here. This is the only one where the Bible says that God is love. It doesn't say God is joy. It doesn't say God is peace. It says God is love. So this is the essence of who God is. If you remove God from the picture, guess what? You can't love because you don't know God. Okay, so moving on. Integrity was the second one we talked about. And integrity, in just in essence, is basically being the same through and through. You're the same here as you are at home, as you are at work. It's being honest and true and real to yourself and real to Jesus, and really tapping into him. Servant leadership is a value. The Bible says that you can't, the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of 
all. So that means you serve everybody, even the people you don't like. Okay? That's very, very important to understand because it's easy to serve people we like and love. But it's not easy to serve those who are not so nice to us. Okay, then this, the fourth one is joy. And joy, do not get this confused. This is not happiness. This is knowing Jesus in the middle of the storm. Trusting him and holding on to him. Flexibility. I'm not talking about yoga poses. I'm not going to sit here and do like downward dog or anything up here or get a goat up on top of me. Um, sorry. But what we're talking about in flexibility is, now you guys are all picturing me with a banana shirt and a goat. <laughs> On my back, aren't you? Yes, I knew it. I knew it. Okay, so flexibility, what we're talking about is being firmly rooted in God's word and being able to withstand this, this, the shifting sands and the winds that blow. You guys realize the, the, plant, the, the trees that last in a hurricane are the ones who are flexible but are deeply rooted. Okay, then we talked about faith. And faith is, is what attaches our root system to Christ. It is believing in things that we cannot see. You guys, even over the things that we can, if we can look at the things we can see, what do we see right now? We see corona, we see racism, we see lawlessness, we see sandstorms from the Sahara, we see, I don't know, killer bugs that come and suck your animals dry, I, all this crazy stuff, right? And if we hold on to those things and we do not hold on to the things we can't see, we're going to freak out. Because guess what? A lot of us are raising children in the middle of this mess. And on top of that, you throw on the internet and you never know what you're going to get. And then you have family. And this family is not just your family oikos, the family that you have at home. It's the family of God and realizing that you are an integral part of it. That you are an important piece of the family of God. And we're going to actually talk about that a little bit today. Not so much family, but be, being a part of the, word of, of the family of God. And understanding that you're part of God's family comes from an understanding of God's word. If you remove the scripture from all of this, guys, you can't know Jesus without this. You can't have Jesus, the real Jesus, aside from this, the word of God. Because this is where he reveals himself in a very, very real way. He shows his character to us there. There's also commitment. And what I mean by commitment is, is being committed to the mission and the cause of Jesus Christ, advancing the kingdom. And that's also kind of like, hey, you know what? I got to look at whether or not I'm committed to Rockfish Church, whether or not I'm committed to the mission of this individual church, and whether or not I fit here. You may not fit here. You may not like kids. Uh, probably need to go somewhere else. <laughs> You may like, not like loud music, or maybe God's trying to refine that in or out of you, whatever. Um, outreach. We believe that outreach is a very, very important component. Why? Because the Bible says to go into all the world making disciples. Notice it says the word go. That means we have to be reaching out and doing things. And sometimes, and many times, especially in today's culture, outreach requires innovation. How do you outreach when people can't get out of their house? That's a little different, right? How do you reach people who are afraid to be, be closer than six feet from you? How do you pray over them? It requires innovation. So we've, innovation, what that means is just being able to come up with different methods to advance the mission. We're married to the mission, not the method. In other words, you know what? The reason we do the music we do today is because we think that works with the society that we live in. Maybe next year it'll be techno. I don't know. Everybody's in here, please, God, no, not techno. <laughs> then it takes creativity. It takes creativity to reach the world. And it takes creativity to express worship to God. Do you guys realize that God is a creative God? I mean, if you, if you doubt that, just look at the aardvark. I mean, like, really, think about the aardvark or platypus or even your own hand. Look at your hand for a second. Think about the intricacies of, intricacies, I can't even talk, intricacies of your hand and what it can do and how it feels 
the ridges that your fingerprints are not like anybody else's even. That takes creativity. God is a creative God. God has made you a creative person. You might be like, well, I don't draw nothing, Nathan. I'm not talking about drawing anything. One of the most creative people I know is Claudia Clark. And she's creative within a box. I don't know how she does it. She's administratively creative. You tell her, hey, I have this issue, this problem, or this thing that I need you to come up with. And uh, she goes, okay, and starts working on it, and she makes it happen. I'm like, how did you do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I, I don't know. I'm administrative. You're creative. She's creative. And the th three we're going to focus on today is maturity, humility, and passion. I thought it was ironic that I got maturity. Last night I was up here preaching in a Batman shirt, and uh, now I'm in bananas. You know, and uh, people are looking at me like, well, did you used to be the youth pastor? How does a youth pastor match maturity? Here's the deal. We're not talking about emotional maturity. We're not talking about mental maturity. We're not talking about even maturity as, as a physical being. We're talking about spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity is not measured by how long you've known Jesus. I want you guys to, put, to, to, to drop that idea. Oh, somebody's followed Jesus for 30 years. They must be really mature. Not necessarily. Spiritual maturity is measured by how well you follow Jesus. How obedient are you? Matter of fact, we believe here that health is more important than growth. Healthy things grow, but also unhealthy things also grow. Nothing great happens through you until it happens in you. In other words, you have to be changed from the inside out. Hopefully, the closer you get to the core of the church, the healthier it should be. Hopefully, we don't have a whole lot of squabbling and things going on. Now, get, get it. We are a family. We will fight, and that's okay. But at the end of the day, we better be trying to make up and not going to bed angry. The best gift we can ever give our ministries is spiritual and relational health. Guys, we have to do this. We have to remember the very last line of the maturity section. We have to remember, we are committed to remembering the most important person you will ever lead is yourself. Maturity is dependent a lot on you. Humility, and, and that growing in maturity requires this. It requires humility. It requires humility. Remembering that we are called to be servants, not celebrities. No staff, organization, church, Family thrives when people in it catch the disease of me. In other words, if you make everything about yourself, it's going to fail. They say that the best person to work for in an organization is the person who's willing to give whatever they have and willing to admit when they're wrong. At Rockfish, we try to keep the main thing the main thing, which is glorifying God, not ourselves or yourself. And this breeds passion. And by passion, I don't just mean, passion, if you look it up in the Bible, many times is negative. Actually, every time is negative. Because what passion is, is it's your drive. If your drive is for anything other than advancing the kingdom of God and the cause of Jesus Christ, your passion is misplaced and it's sin. Well, that's harsh, Nathan. Yeah, it is. But I didn't write the book. Jesus did. Because your focus will be other places. Your focus will be divided. Guys, there was a story of men who dug holes in a roof to drop a friend or lower the friend down into the, to the house so he could be touched by Jesus. That's the picture of passion. What are you willing to go to so your friends, your family, the people you work with, can be touched by Jesus. What are you willing to do? Are you passionate for advancing the kingdom of God? So let's dig these apart a little bit. Let's take them apart. So let's start with maturity. Maturity requires something. It requires us to put effort into it. We have to work at it. It's not something that's going to happen automatically. It's not like you just stand there and go, yeah, I'm going to be all mature today. Because you know what's going to happen. You're going to turn on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And you're going to sit there and watch it. But maturity requires effort. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 4, 14 through 15, it says this. So we may no longer be children. Guys, we don't want to be little kids. Yes, we want to have a faith of a child. We want to be able to do some things like children do. 
that have been squashed out of us in creativity and those kind of things. But the reality is we don't want to be like children in our thinking that we just believe everything. You know, a child looks at an adult and thinks they know everything. It doesn't matter who the adult is. So as children, we no longer be like children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. You understand that the enemy is using people to try to tear down the church and destroy the church. Guys, look at what's going on in the world today. Look at it. You can't hardly look at Facebook. You can't hardly walk into Walmart. You can't hardly look at anything without hearing the term racism and people pointing the finger. Did you know that right now it is wrong for you to ask people why they're wearing a mask or why they're not wearing a mask? It is wrong. Even if you're just curious. Guys, if we do not root ourselves in the maturity of Christ, we will be tossed to and fro by everything. We will get so messed up, we won't know which way is up. Jesus is the answer. Can we land on that? If nothing more than that today, can we land on Jesus is the answer? Okay? So we're not tossed to and fro if we hold on to that. Rather, speaking the truth in love. Guys, I love you like crazy, but I will speak the truth to you. I love my kids like crazy. I will speak the truth to them. But speaking the truth in love, we grow in every way to become what? To become good people, to become good Christians, to become people who tithe constantly? No, in every way into him who is the head, who is Christ. You guys realize that's why we grow in maturity is because we want to be like Jesus. And that takes effort. I'm not teaching works of salvation, Jesus paid it all. But if you want to be like him, you have to start asking questions. Like here's a question that got put on bracelets and stuff and kind of got watered down. What would Jesus do? In other words, how would Jesus respond? How would he handle himself and conduct himself in different situations? How would he handle himself at work? How would he handle himself driving down Skybo Road? Uh, Amen, right? How would he handle himself when his kids are going crazy? Because trust me, we go crazy a lot. So what this means, though, is that maturity is not determined by how long you follow Jesus. It is determined by how well you obey. Obedience is the metrics for maturity. Obedience, even when it's terrible, even when it's not fun. Obedience. We must first obey God. And that requires effort. Second, we got to know what stage we're in. We got to know what stage of life we're in. You know, there's different stages of a follower of Jesus Christ, just like there's different stages of, of a human growing up. The first stage of a follower of Christ is what some people like to call pre-Christian or dead in sin. It's somebody who does not know who Jesus is, and they have specific needs. People who don't know who Jesus is need to hear and see the gospel. What I mean by hear and see the gospel is they don't necessarily need to have, excuse me, need to have somebody preach to them and tell them how they're wrong. They, they, they don't need to have somebody go up to them and beat them over the head with the Bible and argue with them. What they need is people who stand on the word of God, are willing to share the word of God in truth and love, and live it. They need to see the gospel lived in our lives. They need to see the truth of it. They need to see you when you're at work and the boss isn't looking and you're still working. They need to see you say, I love my wife and you're not looking.
They need to see that. The next stage is the stage that comes after they ask. And here's the deal. If somebody comes up to you today and were to ask you, tell me about your Jesus. Tell me why you believe in Jesus. There's going to be all kinds of things floating in your head, right? You know, like, how do I say this? How do I determine this? Let me tell you something. If you cannot nutshell it down, bare minimum, here's what you need to do. You want, you want to know what you need to say to them? Like, I can tell you. I mean, you can share your story and all that stuff, and you can add whatever you want to it. But if you do not share this part and understand this part, you've got to ask yourself where you are in the maturity level. I believe that Jesus is God. He came to earth, lived a perfect and sinless life, died on the cross, and rose again to set me free from my junk. And he's the only way to heaven. That's it. That's the gospel. That's what they need the answer to. The next stage, after they say, hey, you know what? That's really great. I, I love that. I want that. I want to believe. I believe in Jesus. Yes. They pray. They get baptized and stuff. They become what's called a spiritual infant. And a spiritual infant is, is very, very interesting. And it's, they're kind of hard to, to handle. Okay. You know, the problem with spiritual infants is what we do many times with them is we'll take them, we'll say, hey, you know what? You got saved. It's so great. I'm so glad you got saved and you love Jesus. Now let me take you to my church and then we just kind of leave them alone. I mean, think about it. Just go to church. Okay, it's great to have people plugged into church, but these people don't know how to, they're looking around the room. Why are these people raising their hands? Why are they clapping? Why is there somebody waving flags? What, what is this book they're talking about? They don't know where to start. They don't know anything. It's kind of like this. If I were to take, I, my wife and I have had a few children. <sighs> I've learned a few things in those years about having children. Okay, I've never actually had a child. My wife has. I've been there. It's messy. It's messy. It doesn't matter if you have a C-section or if you have it natural. It's messy. Okay, there's no way to make it pretty. It, it's messy. But here's the thing. The baby comes out, how, whatever the delivery method is, the baby comes out, comes out of the hospital, or you go out of the house for the first time if you have a home birth, and you say, okay, what does a baby need? Well, a baby needs food. A baby needs people to love them. A baby needs diapers and clothes. Pretty much what a baby needs, right? So you go and buy all these clothes. You go and you grab some diapers and some wipes, and then you say... Okay, now I know a place where there's plenty of food and I know a place where there's plenty of people. So I'm going to take them and drop them off at McDonald's. There's plenty of food and there's plenty of people who will hold the baby there for you. And then you leave them. What is that called? Neglect, right? Abandonment, neglect, abuse, right? Well, guess what? When we bring a new Christian into the church and we say, hey, guess what? Here's your church. Now I'm going to walk away. That's abandonment, abuse, and neglect. Because maybe the reason why God brought you into their life and had them ask that question of you is because he expects you to parent them a little bit. Parenting is hard. It's, I can't say that word on stage. It's tough, right? But parenting is difficult, but God has, has put you in this place to disciple this person and train this person. It's not some mystical thing that only pastors and really smart people know. If you know a little bit more about Jesus than, than they do, you can show them Jesus and continue to show them Jesus because they're going to have a lot of questions. They don't know what it means to tithe. They hear this word. They're like, what are you talking about? What are you talk talking? What is this mess? Why are you guys throwing money in that bucket? That doesn't make any sense to me. If somebody came to you and said, hey, you know what? I know you just left me to the Lord, but where do I start in this book? What do you tell them? This is a discipleship moment. I'm training you guys. What do you tell them? Where do you tell them to start? Many people will tell them, they'll, they'll just start in Genesis, won't they? John is right. 
John is, shows the character of Jesus Christ. That is the best place to start. But you know what? Most people will start in Genesis. And by the time they get to Leviticus, they're like, what the heck is this mess? Cutting sheep open and stuff. Don't make no sense to me. But we have to train them and teach them and show them. Then the next stage is children. Guess what? Children are going to do what? Ask questions. You get around a child for more than five minutes, they're going to ask you a question. Why does your hair look like that? Why, why, what are you talking about like that? Why, why your breath stink, you know? Kids be asking some crazy stuff. And they want to know. They're curious. And you know what happens in our society when a kid asks questions? We, you should be seen and not heard. Oh, don't make me get up on this soapbox about children. You better not be squashing the questions your kids have because kids come up and ask questions and then what happens when they get out in society and we've squashed those questions, they just say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I'll accept it. Their creativity is gone. Let your children ask questions now when they're starting to ask them at two or three in the morning and you're going, I can't even think straight. Can we talk about this tomorrow? That's fine, but guys... Children have curiosity. When was the last time you were curious? When was the last time you were curious enough to ask the questions and didn't care if you asked the right questions? You just wanted to find out. So children at this stage of maturity, spiritual maturity, they're going to ask questions. Well, what does the Bible mean about this? What does the Bible say about it? I don't understand. Guess what that means? That means we kind of have to kind of share with them. And here's a really cool thing. If you don't know the answer, guess what? You can say, I don't know. Let's find out together. Well, explain the Trinity to me. I don't know. An egg. Anybody been in church for very long, you know what that means. The Trinity is like an egg. There's three equal parts. What? It's like water. There's three states. What? It doesn't make any sense. But they want to know. So you say, you know what? I don't really know how to answer this. There's a lot of really smart people who've studied this. And, and there's even smarter people that God used to write the Bible. So let's find out. Let's find out together. Let's go on this journey. Let's see what we can learn. Then the next stage is spiritual teenager or young adult. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it sounds. My father-in-law, when, when my first daughter became a teenager, he looked at me and he laughed. I'm like, what? He goes, welcome to parenting grad school where you take everything you learned and you throw it away. Let me tell you the key to that is at this stage, they're going to want to do things. They're going to want to be active. They're going to be out serving. They're going to be just driving because they want to advance the kingdom of God. They love Jesus. They're, they're on highs. They get lows and things like that. But then they start asking questions like, well, did, did I do that right? And you look over and you're like, well, the chairs didn't fall over. So yeah, you did it right. What they're really asking for is the affirmation. They want to know they're on the right track. Well, did I tell the person correctly about Jesus? Well, what'd you tell them? So you start breaking it apart. You start talking about it. I remember as a youth pastor, Years and years ago, I was here, and uh, we did this youth event where we would have, around Christmas time, we'd have a concert in here, and the interest fee to the concert was to bring a gift, an unopened, brand new toy to get into the concert. And so we had, one year, we had like 500 and some gifts. So we went to the Walmart parking lot, and we had wrapped them, and we were giving them away. And we weren't asking people when they went into Walmart, because we were like, we don't want them not to spend their money at Walmart and Walmart get mad at us. So we were asking them as they walked out. So we were doing that for about 20 minutes <clears throat> and uh, a Walmart employee came up to us and said, hey, you guys gotta go. We're like, kids were like, why, what? Gotta go, yeah, you can't be doing this. And we came back here and the kids were all excited. Like, yes, we got just, just got persecuted for our faith. And because we were telling people about Jesus. And I looked at him, I said, is that what you think really happened? They go, yeah, that's what happened. I said, well, what I really thought was that your youth pastor forgot to contact Walmart and administratively failed. <laughs> and they said, what? 
I was like, yeah, you guys weren't persecuted for your faith. You were persecuted for your youth pastor being stupid. <laughs> and they were like, oh, man. But we started debriefing and talking about things and struggling it out and really talking and challenging them. Guess, guess what? As a parent, there's, there's a little parenting tidbit for teenagers. They really want your affirmation. They want to know when they do things right. They don't just want to hear when they do things wrong. I've learned that the hard way. The last stage is a spiritual parent. This is when you, as a follower of Jesus, are making disciples of other people. And you're showing them who Jesus is. And you're walking them through these stages. So know what stage you're in. The next thing you need to do is you need to be willing to change. No change will occur in your life unless you're willing to change. Now here's the deal. God will take you through some mess until you are willing to change. He'll have you walk around a mountain for 40 years in the middle of the desert. Here's the one thing I want to challenge you guys is just have your heart ready to be changed because you don't want to be Jonah. Jonah was resistant to change every single time. He got spewed out of a fish. He got dehydrated and he got disappointed and he walked away from the end of the story and nobody knows his ending. We don't know if he changed or not. Guys, we have to be willing to change in order to mature. And that requires humility. In humility, we have to adopt this attitude of it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about God, and it's about them. It's not about me. Philippians 2, 3 says this, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Count others more significant than yourself. It's not about you. It's not about me. And that creates you into a person who's uplifting and is willing to share the love of Jesus Christ with others. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Guys, we're called to encourage each other, not tear each other down, not put each other down, but to encourage. And that requires Humility, and it builds humility in yourself because it doesn't say encourage them when they're nice to you. Three, humility allows you to embrace who you are in the kingdom of God. This is vital because I used to think that humility was you let people tell you what to do, be, tell you who to be, and walk all over you and use you. But you guys have to understand when you take that stance, that's pride. That's pride in disguise. Humility says, I know who I am in Jesus Christ. I know that I am a prince or a princess to the king of kings. And I have the authority and the power to take this land. You guys realize we have the power and the authority to take the United States of America for Jesus Christ. To change this nation. To transform it from the inside out. And that creates passion. Passion for advancing the kingdom of God. We have to let passion fuel us. That passion for the kingdom of God has to burn inside of us because God has given us a mandate. He has called us to something greater, something bigger, something better. Isaiah 54, 2 through 3. Yeah, you probably thought I was going back to Matthew, but Isaiah 54, 2 through 3 says this, Enlarge the place of your tents. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your pegs. For you will spread abroad to the right and the left, and your descendants will possess the nations and resettle the desolate cities. What this means is, guys, get ready to expand your influence. 
Get ready to be stretched beyond compare. Get ready to go and advance the kingdom of God. That needs to be your passion and your drive. If you are in love with Jesus Christ and you are going to take the city for him, take the city. That's what he's commanding us to do. This isn't like, oh, I'm going to stretch out my tent a little bit. No, he's talking about, dude, tear it down. Let's go. Get rid of that pup tent and build a circus tent. You're going to need more. So let it fuel you. And when passion for the kingdom of God fuels you, it draws others to, to God. You guys realize we are not called to drag people out of hell. We are not called to drag people into the kingdom of God, kicking and screaming. We are called to show them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we show them the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are like a moth to the flame. They are drawn to it. You ever been around someone who's passionate and excited about something? You get excited about it. Get around people. Go, go find somebody who's passionate about something you have no interest in and find out what happens. You'll be like, oh my gosh, I need to go spend all my money on that because that's the way to go. But passion for the kingdom of God draws others to God. It's not our job to change people. It's his. It's just our job to draw them to him. Passion also creates change. You will not stay the same. If you become passionate about the kingdom of God, you will not stay the same. I had a friend of mine who was very passionate about Green Bay Packers. Let me tell you something. You get around him. You got Green Bay Packers fans in here? Yeah. Man, he was blowing air horns and mess out of his house. I was his neighbor. I wanted to shoot him one night, man. I was trying to sleep at 2 in the morning. Arrgh! But let me tell you something. You get around him, you watch a game with him, you're like, man, I think I'm a secret Packers fan. I have no idea. Can I go get a, pe a head piece for cheese, you know? Come on. But he was passionate. And getting passionate about the word of God creates change in your life. You will make room for it. It also, and this is added, as we talked, as the communicators, we started talking and kind of hashing through this. Um, that's why it's not in your notes. We said we needed to to underscore this, it will prioritize your life. Guys, what motivates you, moves you. It will get you out of the seat. It will get you to rearrange your life to make things happen. Some of you, you get passionate about the kingdom of God, you might switch careers. Some of you might say, I'm called to the mission field. Some of you might say, I'm called to love that stinky little neighborhood kid. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you might say, I'm called to heal a relationship that's broken. It will prioritize your life. So I leave you with this question. A catalyst is something that changes its environment but is not changed. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit of God to be the catalyst in you and use you to be the catalyst for the world? <laughs> Zephaniah 2, 3 says this, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. And perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Guys, I hate to break it to you. This year is not as bad as it's going to get. It's going to get worse. But if you want to find a shelter in that storm, seek the things of God. Seek the values of God and run after that. Let's pray. Father, I pray as your people that as we begin to, to run after you, that we will embrace your values that we will grab onto you, that we will seek and save that which has been lost, Father, that we will be people of humility, maturity, and passion for advancing the kingdom of God, that we will not let the enemy win any longer. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we say, Father, you are God. In Jesus' name, amen.